it is still morning, isn't it? I was going to say good morning, everyone. Yeah, we are still in the morning. Um, welcome back. Hopefully you've all grabbed uh, a little coffee or tea or juice, you know, whatever it floats your boat. Um, and we're all nice and ready and relaxed uh, to go into the second part of the forum today. Just as a quick reminder, um, again, I'm, there were still a few comments about people joining late. I don't know why there were some issues with, with blog on today, so we'll, we'll have a look into that. But there's a few of you. But anybody that's missed the first two presentations, so from Richard or from Fred, um, like I said, as a reminder, we will be putting these videos up individually on our website um, and yeah, our, our YouTube BCA um, forum. So yeah, have a have a look at those. You haven't missed it. You may have missed it now, but you're not going to miss it forever. So uh, log on there if you need to. Um, and great. So I think everybody's back. We've got 241 participants with us, which is, yeah, really amazing number. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, though, I would like to invite uh, Matthew, Dr. Matthew Davis from Kilgrim, going to be talking about silverfish today. Um, so, Matthew, if you can please reveal yourself. There you are, fabulous. How are you doing, Matthew? Good, thanks. Good. Good, good. Are you, are you in sunny Yorkshire? The sun always shines in Yorkshire and Lancashire. It, it does be. It does be. It's a lovely day. But um, listen, I'll, I'll leave you to it for your introductions. And yeah, tell us a bit about Silverfish. That'd be great. Okay, thanks, Natalie. And good, good morning, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'll just check that I can share my screen. I'll get going with the presentation. There we go. Okay, we should be up and running. Um, so hopefully people can see my opening opening slide. Yep. Um, thanks for confirming, Natalie. That's that's really handy. So yeah, I'll, I'll take you on a whistle stop tour through um, current knowledge on on silverfish. Uh, more than one species, as the as the talk title suggests. I'll look a little bit about identification of some of the the common species and some of the lesser known ones, a few things about monitoring, um, a couple of good points about control measures that are available and, and soon to come as well. And um, yeah, should be a, an interesting one. I quite like pests like this because they, they come along and um, everybody learns as they go. So it, it's it's interesting for me uh, to pick up new information as, as we learn about these different species and hopefully interesting for everybody else as well. And always happy to learn from people's experiences as well. The more we share information about up and coming pests, the better, better for everybody. Um, so yeah, here we go. Know your silverfish. That's a bit of a message of, of today. Uh, so just looking on the first slide, then I'll just sort of say a couple of things that have have changed since I've done silverfish presentations in the past. Um, on the right hand side, well, we'll, we'll talk about images in a moment. Actually, um, on the right hand side, I'm showing what we call the grey silverfish, and there's a bit of a weakness actually in me using. Um, a common name for insects. We want to use scientific names, species names, just to be nice and nice and accurate. And on that note, in the past, we've used Tenolopisma longicau data as the official name for grey silverfish. Um, that's now changed. The scientists have had a word, and the preference is to use Tenolopisma longicau data. People are probably switching off the webinar right away, got into detail. I don't mind this because if we get used to being accurate, accurate and we get into good habits and use the current proper name, then we're accurate in everything we do. And I think it's important to do that because on the continent, I've got colleagues at Kill Germ Germany um, that talk about the paper fish. And we have that, not a problem, but that challenge sort of worldwide. The common names vary. It can be confusing. We talk about these different species, but if we stick to the proper name, then we're using that same universal language, singing from the same hymn sheet. And in fact, um, comparing it to, it's wrong. I, I would say the common silverfish, Lepisma saccharina, well, the way things are going, we probably won't call that the common silverfish anymore because there's evidence in certain parts of the world that the grey silverfish is the most numerous, the one that we encounter more than others in terms of public health pest control. So I sometimes like to drop the word common where I can because uh, things change and populations are in flux and we'll look at we'll look at some of the data for that okay so now i've got the uh, scientific name fixed out of the way um i'll say a good thing that we've got when it comes to recognizing different silverfish species we do have an improvement in the identification resources that are available things are that bit more accessible now 
a bit more out in the public domain rather than tucked away in scientific papers. I think entomologists in the UK have got to grips with the different species and they've got that confidence in terms of identifying them so we can help you know, folks doing the, the hard work on the ground in terms of pest control. And uh, so there's a lot more to work on in terms of ID. And that's a beneficial thing. I think we also know now with relatively recent data, we know where things like the grey silverfish are, where they aren't, where the numbers are at their greatest, and where perhaps numbers are a bit a bit lower, sort of up and coming areas in parts of the world for these uh, these newer species. Um, so yeah, that's one to watch out for. We will show some distribution maps as I work the way through the uh, through the presentation there. So let's do that. I'll also give a little flavour, a little insight on what we think regarding um, public health risks um, about particularly the grey silverfish. We've got some research that came out of a project with Kilgem and Aston University there. And we can share that with everybody just so we're all up to date with potential risk to human health. I'll also make sure I've got a slide on um, a new guidance document. On, not new, actually. It's been around since 2019. That's a, a good update of it. Um, a guidance document regarding grey silverfish control. Um, that should be the one thing that you do from my presentation. When I click through to that slide, make a note of the title of it, download it. That's a really good document. It'll be fantastic for everybody um, when they come to control these species, as well as working within product labels as well, of the right uh, baits that are available. Um, I'll give an example of a monitoring option. There are a number of options out there. I'm just picking one as, a, as an example, so we'll have a look at that. Uh, and we'll discuss a couple of talking points about baiting products for, for silverfish. Um, I know you'll have heard from uh, Syngenta this morning about an active ingredient in doxacarb and uh, and how that works. Um, I'll mention there's a clothanidin bait available for silverfish control, and yet data on indoxacarb as a bait for, for grey silverfish control. So we'll look at that one. Okay, so here's a little example. Um, it's a simple sheet that Killjoe produced just to help people with basic recognition of silverfish species that are out there. So we've got the um, silverfish Lepisma saccharina on the ID sheet. And in fact, what I'll do, I'll sort of focus on the image of it here. So that's Lepisma saccharina. I am hesitating to say common silverfish. I can probably just about get away with saying that today because on balance, it is still pretty common in the UK. We don't think it's been overtaken by um, the grey silverfish, which is the species next to it here. Just spot a few features on there. I think what I'll highlight, the contrasting features between the two, just to keep it a bit, not rough and ready, but field ready. You know, times 10 hand lens, th things to spot in the field. We're not carrying a, a microscope around with us in the, uh, in the, in the kit. Um, look at the, the length of the antennae on the grey silverfish versus the length on the common silverfish a lot longer in comparison, really quite distinctive. Um, I'll use the word tails for now. We can be a little bit informal this morning. The length of the tails on the grey silverfish, a lot longer in comparison to the common silverfish there. And a few observations, the common silverfish, is that more silvery in colour? I know that's not 100% reliable, but as an overall impression, um, a bit more of a dull colour. We've also got this fringe of hairs at the front here as well. So little differences there. That are recognition in the field. I'll hesitate to say identification because we need to get things under a microscope and look for other detailed features. But I hope those key things really stand out in terms of telling apart those two differences. And um, I think in terms of why we need to know the difference, well, it's all about using um, relevant baits that have the grey silverfish on the label. They're meant for the control of that species and will be most effective against that one. It's what they've been tested against. I think also understanding that the environmental requirements do differ. The Pisma saccharina control of that relies heavily on reduction of humidity. Whereas the grey silverfish, then it can survive in drier conditions. Reducing humidity is always a good idea in terms of insect control in general, but it's not the be all and end all. We need to look at other control measures as well. So just appreciating that difference, it's always relevant to identify the, the species. Um, but yeah, things like that are out there and available for people to, to look at. So good to know what's available. I think as well, 
this is a recognition thing on based on a couple of photos. Um, I encourage everyone strongly, always send samples, physical samples, to an entomologist just to get them checked for identification purposes. Um, you can't do better than a physical sample. Send in images. We occasionally get that. It's often difficult. We can't always see the relevant features that we need to. Difficult to give a definitive result by photographs. So I don't encourage people to do that. We're still in that world of physical specimens, which is which is what we like most. Um, I think also it's crucial to send physical specimens because out there in the field, when you're dealing with insects that are a bit on the delicate side, the antennae, the, the so-called tails, they're brittle. They break off easily. The sample that you've got can look very different to these nice pristine images that I've got. And thinking of the life cycle of these insects, they have a number of nymphal stages, so there's a size variation. The nymphs look a little bit different to the adults as well. So again, another good reason to send those physical samples in. Uh, we've all seen it as well. Insects stuck on a glue board, covered in glue, hard to ID. Um, your customer, member of the public, might have sprayed them with something tacky. Um, so yeah, always good to get that get that sent in. And in fact, I'll show you just this little little video clip. This is the grey silverfish or Tenolopisma mongicaudatum that I caught in a little insect pot. Um, no shame for the branding there. I've got kill gem on the side of the insect pot, but, but so what? It's on my slides, so that, yeah, I'm sure you can let me off for that. Um, and this one's just having a bit of a, a wriggle around, but you can see it's a field collected specimen. The long antennae were there when I picked it up, but they've broken off just from a bit of handling and just from being in the insect pot. A um, couple of the tails largely intact, but yeah, they're, they're broken off as well. So that, that, that field specimen uh, has seen a bit of, a bit of action. Um, I remember this particular sample as well. Um, I, wouldn't, I won't say embarrassment, but it reminded me to be cautious with what we say when we give give presentations. Um, I went all the way to Poland, spent some time with Kildare in Poland, and gave a presentation to the, the Polish guys and girls out there. And you know, I ventured that in their areas where I was speaking, um, no known records of grey silverfish. And I was due to give my presentation first thing in the morning. It turned out on the evening in the um, in the bar, I spotted this silverfish in the bar and caught it in that sample pot. Um, so that kind of ruined my first slide in the morning. And um, and also speaking to guys at break time and lunchtime, you find that they've seen them. They were there and present in their area of Poland, but the academic records of the databases, there were no entries on there. So we rely on records, written records and submissions, just because they're not necessarily officially recorded doesn't mean the insects aren't there. Um, so again, it's another good reason for people to communicate what they've got and get things verified. Uh, so yeah, might not have been written down what they are, are out there. Okay, so moving past my little insect pot. Um, what did Killgem do? We've got an insect ID service. People have been sending silverfish into us over the years and sort of going back to kind of 2017 i'll zoom in there we've got samples of the gray silverfish that have come through to the kill gem id service we got these published and they're cropping up in various parts of the united kingdom and ireland as well so you've got southampton cork doncaster leeds cork london and a few other few other areas um, also cropping up in in Leeds and as far north as Aberdeen, we think that was probably the first recorded uh, sample listed up in Scotland. So try and make sure we include everybody and not just talk about about England. Um, Ashford and Cheltenham cropped up on our list. Um, I suppose if we were doing this as a as a live audience in front of people, I'd, I'd expect people expect people to go, "Hey, when I mention your town, you know, uh, a bit of local pride." Um, where else have we got here? Hartley. Um, we've also got Ipswich and North London on the Kilgem ID database, and also South East London and, and Peterborough. And um, so these are from sort of 2017 up to 2021, and then right at the bottom there, South East London and Canterbury. And we've popped some of these on the map, so we get an idea of where we've received samples from um, Kilgem wise and other sources of identification as well. So relatively widespread in the UK and the size of the dot indicates the sort of number of samples that have been been picked up. So there's certainly 
certainly out there. Um, I'll just have another look over this just to tell people where they might expect to find them in terms of the types of premises, and it is pretty, pretty broad. So I'm going to look here. Student accommodation, yeah. Domestic accommodation, so the people's homes, yeah. Flats, correct. Apartments. And I suppose why are we talking about them? Well, they are, they are a nuisance insects, but they've got potential to damage you know, exhibits and items in stately homes and museums and galleries. There's that threat to, to delicate items. Uh, one of the first records in the UK, they were associated with cereal, uh, some grazing on things like that, carbohydrate paste, backings, bindings of books, um, wallpaper paste. Can be imported on paper and pallets, cardboard. There's documented evidence of that. So a nuisance insect with some some levels of damage as well, but certainly of concern in the museum sector. Look at the museum records from what's eating your collection. So there's an importance there. Um, domestic premises crop up again on the list. Offices as well. So that sits with sort of paper and cardboard um, being brought in. And then more domestic accommodation as well from the kill germ records. And then a museum record from kill germ ID as well. So yeah, Good number of uh, locations, pretty widespread in recent years, and some of you may recognise your parts of the world on there as well. And then thinking of guys over in Ireland, there's some records out there. So certainly getting around and transported by by human activities. That seems to be the way with them, um, with insect species getting around the world. So that's what we find. Okay, so that was a bit of a look at the UK situation. Going to expand things out and look Europe wide because we might have people sort of tuning in from different parts of the world. And um, perhaps there's some people from um, sort of Scandinavia uh, looking in for a bit of uh, information and advice. And, and Norway crops up for sure. Um, I'll talk about the guidance that's available. That a lot of the expertise on grey silverfish in particular comes from Norway, Belgium, and the Netherlands, and, and so on. Um, so in the UK, we rely on that. These things have been there. For longer in those areas than they have in the UK. Uh, Germany is a good example as well. So relying on European colleagues and counterparts for information and advice is a is a good place to be, really. Um, but yeah, I'll look at the um, some distribution over here. Expansive in terms of confirmed records that have been backed up officially, confirmed identifications, formally entomologists and so on. So throughout Europe, nice and widespread in uh, in Western Europe. Um, and more towards the other side, records, but not sort of fully confirmed. We class those as unverified in uh, in the orange areas. So in the usual sort of familiar places and actually in a lot of the kill germ territories uh, throughout Europe. Someone to keep an eye on. In terms of sheer numbers that are recorded, and I'll pick out a few of the countries, um, the darker red indicates greater numbers recorded. So we've got Spain, we've got Belgium, the Netherlands, got Italy that stands out and certainly Norway as well so the highest number of records available um, citizen reports identification databases atlases of distribution of insects they all add up um, so yeah they're the main main countries for activity according to the sort of official records there so yeah just gives, gives people an idea of, uh, of the spread really Okay, um, just to make sure on um, the public health significance of these things then. Um, Kiljan worked with uh, Federica Boyocci, Aston University, our microbiologist there, uh, Professor Anthony Hilton, and some of you will have heard we're doing some um, more recent stuff with with rodents at University of Reading and Anna Carolina Yamakawa, and totally different angle today we're thinking about the insects. Um, as part of Federica's work, she surveyed insect populations and um, certainly throughout the West Midlands. And there were some hotspots of grey silverfish activity. And what did she find? She isolated bacteria from grey silverfish. So that gives us a bit of a picture. Staphylococcus, Acinetobacter, Bacillus, Curia. And these were taken from the outside of the insects, so the exoskeleton, the external surface. She also washed and then macerated these insects, the grey silverfish, and looked at their internal structures. And within that, we found the harbourage of Staphylococcus, Cinetobacter, 
bacillus and curcuria. What does that mean? You find bacteria in a lot of areas uh, and a lot of different insects, to be honest. Um, we need to think a little bit about the risk. Our general conclusion was that these were really opportunistic pathogens, not the sort of traditional, more serious things like the food poisoning organisms, you know, Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter. Um, so we're not saying this this huge risk to public health, but there is some opportunistic potential threat there. So still worth considering their role as potential contaminant and a foreign body, not something that we want um, near food and food prep services as a general rule anyway. And there's some potential mechanical transfer of bacteria as these things move from surface to surface. Uh, but yeah, here's the one, my, my recommendation, um, just to flesh out your own reading. And it's something that we rely on as well. Um, make sure you go and find from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, um, long-tailed silverfish, biology control, freely available as a PDF on um, on the internet, takes into account field experience and scientific trials, studies on the biology of the insects. It's a really, really good resource. And the folks involved with this have got that expertise. And I mentioned a couple of scientific papers coming up as well um, that names uh, some of the scientists involved with this, this kind of work. Kilgem have had that contribution, like I said, to the distribution in the UK. We've added to the knowledge base in that way. And of course, with the, the public health side of things, we've made a few comments on that. Uh, but yeah, add into the picture, but make sure you get a, you can do sort of a photograph of that if you want, or um, print screen and um, search that out at your own, at your own leisure. Okay, so keeping an eye on, on time. Um, just to mention, we do receive silverfish samples Lepisma saccharina and Tenolepisma longicaudatum on various insect monitors. They will blunder on standard blue blue traps. Um, there are some that are marketed and advertised and, and designed a bit more specifically towards um, capturing different silverfish species. So, you know, do your own evaluations, be aware there's general monitors out there as well as more specific ones and make those sort of informed choices on efficient monitoring. And things like this, you want to sort of replace them roughly every six to eight weeks. I think one used every sort of 25 square meters is a good guide for placement and typical shelf life. You're looking around two years. Uh, so sort of standard guidance really for, for monitoring. Um, yeah, always worth having monitoring tools in, in place. And um, just looking at some of the science that's out there, we know in the scientific literature that efficacy is shown for two active ingredients, one being chlorothionidin and one being indoxacarb in baits for grey silverfish control. Um, all the right setup is involved in terms of the experiments. We've got harbourage areas where the food and bait is placed for the silverfish with water available, areas for egg deposition. We've got choice situations where the insects are choosing between a palatable bait versus an alternate food source. So all the right setup uh, is done there. That's led to um, you know, the right studies in terms of efficacy for biocide product regulations. And there is a chlorothionidin debate currently authorised in the UK with grey silverfish on the label. And of course, today, hearing from uh, various people about indoxacarb, that's uh, that's one on the, on the horizon. So it, it's good to have options um, in terms of control measures, you know, palatability, always of interest and you know a variety of methods can help with resistance management as well so positive to see various options there and um, there's some data out there in the, um, the papers and they're proving that um, we've got efficacy with relevant active ingredients in terms of primary poisoning we've got sort of numbers of days down here so we can sort of see speed of control um, percentage of surviving individuals is very low after a relatively short time period for different active ingredients. Uh, we've also got some levels of, of secondary poisoning over time as well uh, with certain ingredients. So that's all out there. And I won't pick through the detail, but it's more me making a point that there is that reassurance with control techniques that there is the data behind it. And that's a take home point for today, really, rather than digging into that into that detail but yeah have that reassures that what we've got what will be coming has got that backing uh behind it um i kind of like this one it, it's it's taken from a, a really interesting research paper um but i like how 
how practical is it is because it's reflected on the um, on on bait labels. Um, so the researchers have gone with different distributions of the bait, and what we've got. I'm not going to zoom in actually. Yeah, we've got an option here where these black areas of the harbourage for the grey silverfish. And we've got bait droplets sort of concentrated in the centre. But what we actually find, if you distribute the bait spots like that, you don't get the greatest amount of kill over time. If you evenly distribute the spots, that sort of improves things. If you put the spots towards the edges, that's not bad. But actually, um, we've got that greater effect where we've got a larger number of small spots distributed evenly, but around edges, um, you know, that seems to match the sort of movement and harbourage points of, of grey silverfish. So it's not just using the right bait in terms of palatability and potency of the active ingredient. It's, it's how we put it down. And I like that. That's the skill of, you know, uh, the pest controller um, out there on the ground in the field. And that makes a huge, huge difference, really. So, yeah, good to see that, that interesting research there. Um, and a similar thing as well, a um, little bit of a complicated slide, but in a single house where we've got a few large bait droplets, um, eventually we sort of get control over time, but it takes a while. Whereas we, where we've got many small bait droplets, the, the darker colour put down in this apartment complex, and the number of individuals drops really quite rapidly. So again, that's just that proof that the many small bait droplets uh, works well. It sounds like baiting for mice, doesn't it? And the sporadic feeders, small amounts of bait, space very frequently for mice. Well, you know, similar principle here for uh, the grey silverfish. And just watch that on labels. Um, you know, the baiting amounts can be quite different to cockroaches. So don't get sort of stuck in a, in a cockroach recipe. Um, look for the specifics of the of the label when, uh, when available. Okay, so we're getting towards the end. It's a short slot. I think I'm on until sort of half past 11. So I'll make sure I fit the, the timings for everybody there. Um, just on a bit of a tangent, this is my whole thing about you know grey silverfish versus common silverfish, so Tenolipisma longicaudatum versus Pisma saccharina. That's fine. We talked about those. Um, we did have a sample sent in to, to kill Joe. Um, and we think it might be the first confirmed UK record of something else, the four-lined silverfish, Tenolipisma lineata. It does have that lined appearance. So a bit of a curious one. We're not uh, sort of too knowledgeable about this one. It's not hugely studied. Um, perhaps there's some pest potential. Maybe it'll just be more of a nuisance insect. It's got an ability to digest cellulose, according to, to papers out there. Um, so an interesting one. Not going to give any more detail today, sort of leaving people hanging in the short um, time slot. But yeah, potentially the first record in the UK. Could be something to look at in the future. Uh, my colleagues uh, in Europe have told me in their in their territories um, to look out for something called the ghost silverfish, um, Tenolipisma calvum in Central Europe. Um, so again, something of interest, not detected in the UK, um, but another sort of newish species to look at. There is some indication that Indoxacarb is effective against this species. Um, not read any reports of damage myself. It's not to say that doesn't happen, but the feeling at the minute is more of a nuisance insect than anything else. Um, but yeah, a bit of a bit of a one to look out for for the future. So I think we'll try and cover this in uh, some industry articles in the in the press at some point. But yeah, a bit of a taste. So I'll leave people sort of hanging there, and that's uh, sort of where we are. So yeah, hopefully a few points of interest there. And um, twenty nine minutes past eleven. So hopefully that makes the. Uh, organizers happy that i've stuck to time so um that's me i'll um i'll wait to hear from natalie and maybe there's a couple of questions on the chat that i'll make a note of and, and see how we can we can help so great thank you, thank you matthew you know per perfect time in terms of you know, what, what we planned but we've got another 10 minutes for questions as well so yeah okay. excellent i've got nice. three in the inbox you probably had a sight of them anyway but i'll just uh, read them out for the benefit of everyone else um on here so are silverfish linked to allergen concerns for households Oh, that's a really good question for Ian, this, you know. Um, now then, I can't recall if there are any papers on this about the allergen. I'll have to look into it. I know um, I know that the um, 
and it's a different species, but the World Health Organization quite interested in um, the sort of burden that pests mm. place, and that includes things like allergic responses. Um, it includes effects on on mental health as well. I know there are papers out there regarding cockroaches and you know the allergic response in people. And generally, and anecdotally, I know a few people in the industry that are sort of retired over the years that do have their own allergic responses to insect specimens, having dealt mm. with them for a long period of time, and that can bring about allergic asthma. Mm. Um, it wouldn't surprise me, but I'm struggling to wrap my brains of a defined source for me to say a definite yes or no. But I think in general, insect presence and fragments have got potential um, in terms of allergic asthma. You know, the presence of rats and mice can set people off with allergic mm. asthma as well. Dust mites are known, cockroaches are known. So it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a shock. Um, so would it work with insects, you know, with the cockroaches or silvers? What what is what is it that they'll they maybe specifically what allergy what, what are the allergens? What what does it sort of come from, if you like? Yeah, th there'll be various parts of their body that they shed into the environment. I'm going to presume it's, you know, fragments of the exoskeleton there'll be antigens associated with, with that insect. It could possibly be in um, fecal matter and other excretions. That's what I imagine it would be. Th these things have been identified, mm. uh, various types of proteins and antigens. But yeah, it must be from that. It's probably from uh, the cast cuticle or exoskeleton, probably associated with, with fecal matter as well. And these mm -hmm. things sort of sit around in the environment, even after control measures. You know, you sort of worry about people vacuuming up and, you know, without a HEPA filter, what fragments are kicked up into the air that could be could be inhaled. So I think a, a general clean down is always a good idea after dealing with insect activity because of what lingers there in the yeah. environment afterwards. Indeed, yeah. it's interesting stuff, isn't it? These are problems they can cause us. And you mentioned about you know, the mental health uh, side of it as well and how they can affect people, you know, the papers that have been written. And yeah, absolutely. Whether it's physiological or, or psychological, it can have a lot of, lot of impact. Um, uh, so Mike, quite a generic one, but what, what's your recommended best treatment for silverfish? Yeah, that's a good question. I can see that from Mike on the, on the Q&A. Um, so, yeah, certainly... Um, Sort of going through the right process in my own mind, get that species identified first. You know, grey silverfish are prominent on relevant labels. Um, and you know, the common silverfish, then we're looking at general reduction in humidity as a good idea in general. Bear in mind that it's not as crucial for grey silverfish, mm -hmm. therefore, we need to consider available and approved control options such as relevant insecticidal baits. So identification, reduction of humidity is a good idea anyway. Use of approved baits in accordance with the label directions. Um, ahead of that, a survey and inspection, signs of activity and use of the monitoring traps. Mm -hmm. um, I think use of monitoring traps, um, you know, that's a good idea as an early warning system. It's a good idea to assess the levels of activity throughout the treatment and also at the end of the treatment, just keep those in place in sensitive situations. There's always that sort of concern with baits down that are we taking insects out of the population on the monitors that perhaps might be available uh, to transfer that to yeah. the rest of the population. So we leave that open to people's own sort of decision on, on the ground and on the on the job. Um, use of diatomaceous earth is effective, but again, sort of bearing in mind that we don't want to interrupt um, you know the bait process too much. I think I'd be tempted to say avoid the use of repellent insecticide sprays such as pyrethroids. Yeah, because we want we don't want to sort of contaminate bait points, push insects away from bait, and we don't want to sort of um, influence the monitoring one way or another. You can stop insects accessing the monitors, or you can flush them onto it, and either way it gives a false representation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that that's sort of a basic basic rundown, really. With with, with the baits, because um, I know labels are getting very you know a lot more specific now. Is it for generally for silverfish use, or is it just for the grey silverfish uh, rather than uh, other species? Do you, you know, do you know what they say in the labels? Yeah, I think um, you know the labels that I've had access to at the minute. They're they're stating um, with confidence results and testing regarding the the, the grey silverfish. So I'm sort of sticking to that that label yeah. direction. That would be nice and nice and strict and specific. Um, yeah. But, you know, further information from manufacturers is always good. And, you know, if we see label changes over 
over time, and that's that's fair as well. But yeah, I'll, I'll still stick to the stick to that pest species that's listed on the layer and follow follow that is the best advice. Great. What about proofing? Is there anything to do with with regard to proofing? You know, sealing around cracks and crevices. Does that does that really have much of an impact? You think? Um, you know, I think it's it's always something that's worth worth considering. Um, I'm not going to say I've seen major evidence that that's a huge benefit in silverfish control, but again, it's it's part of integrated pest management you know we're not sort of thinking of, of rats and mice where you know it's well established um but yeah an integrated pest management approach is, is the usual thing for sure good stuff um and the last one from david here so um great presentation a nice compliment there i agree um how are gray and fish spread from building to building yeah they, they can be brought in um and transported around so there's, there's records of them being brought in um in deliveries of cardboard paper um, packaging, um, pallets and items like that. And of course, especially the grey silver fish, it can tolerate, um, you know, the slightly drier conditions as well. So that sort of explains the, the survival as well. There'll be some small amounts of movement between adjoining areas as well, because they're relatively, relatively mm -hmm. mobile. But yeah, they're, they're sort of the main routes that we're, we're aware of really. So hopefully that, that mm -hmm. helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um there's no there's no more questions in the in the in the Q and A at the moment. So I just thought it was just, okay. you know my own benefit and everyone else's as well. Talking uh, regarding the reduction of humidity because people ask this a lot. You know what what's probably the realistic ways that can be done? Obviously, you know dehumidifier. I suppose um I don't know. What's yeah, the, yeah I, I always think this is it's nice and easy for me to sit behind the uh, the camera on the laptop and put a bullet point on my PowerPoint slide and say reduce humidity. Um, but yeah, it's a good it's a good question. Um, we are a little bit limited, aren't we? It's, it's dehumidifiers. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that dehumidifiers tend to take moisture out of the air. Um, and what we're hoping for really is reduction in humidity and some more hidden areas and cracks and crevices, and that, that can take time. Even simple things like, you know, ventilation in terms of opening windows. Um, I know these things sort of seem um, small, I don't want to sound like a personal trainer or an athlete, but marginal gains they do mm -hmm. make a make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and your know, people will use certain levels of heating as well. There, there are experts out there in that in that field, you know, drying areas out, and also sort of leave that uh, to the experts in that area. Um, and yeah, they're, they're they're the main things. Just thinking of sort of the Pisma saccharima, the common silverfish, things like that, and plaster beetles and book lice. Um, it can be little pockets of humidity, you know, that little tucked away areas in people's kitchens where you're, you're boiling the kettle 10 times a day if you're working from home. Um, mm -hmm. You've got, mm -hmm. you know, pasta boiling, rice boiling, clothes on the radiator, all that humidity building up. Uh, you've not opened the windows because it's a, a bit of a blast of cool air outside. All mm -hmm. those small domestic things make little differences. So if you can remedy that, then that's a good, yeah. good show. Oh, that's and that's some, you know, sort of going over and above extra advice that, you know, pest control has given that to their customers. Yeah. I'll be like, wow, you know, I didn't even even think of that. I know with my cooker when I'm boiling pasta, you know, you can always see the yeah. residue of the of it, of it going up. So, yeah, certainly those pockets of, yeah. Um, you know, I've seen a good comment from Dave, Dave Parnell, though. He's, he's, he's put a particular tip on. Don't share with the world, Dave. You can patent that. Yeah. <laughs> put kill, yeah, put kill jam blue red stripes on it and uh, that'll work indeed indeed but yeah heat he is a uh, you know is, is another way like you say um it's being used used a lot more um pretty specialist isn't it when it comes to whole rooms or, or properties but um i don't know would you would you better use like a handheld um i say steamer i don't like that word um but you know those handheld devices for cracks and crevices again maybe that's even an option if there's you know a particularly bad problem yeah, I, th I think they're established against um, things like bed bugs, and I sort of prefer to stick to where we've got data for those. But as a, as a general comment, you know, 180 degrees C steam directly in insects, uh, you know, it's going to kill the ones that I'm familiar with. Uh, yeah, I think we're good there. I think we're slightly 11.39. Oh, so. Yeah, I know. That's it. Yeah, perfect yeah. timing. So, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you again, Matthew. Um, really interesting talk. Everyone agrees. So, yeah, have a, an amazing day. And yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Goodbye. Cheers.